In the last episode, <laughs> we were discussing <laughs> what is a spiritual mind. And we're talking about what it means to have a spiritual mind, to function in a spiritual mind. And if you look in your manual there, the very last paragraph on the same page says, A spiritual mind is one that chooses to speak only what God has said about a situation as exemplified in the Bible. If that's all you talk, that, then you will have a spiritual mind. I guarantee it. There's no way that that's all you can talk and everything you say matches the Word of God and you not be spiritual. Right? I'm not talking about just quoting scriptures and things that I'm talking about. You actually, this is how you live. Right? Now, a spiritual mind is not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. A spiritual mind is not moved by circumstances, situations, or events. It simply continues to move with God. There is no such thing as a spiritual Christian that is nervous or fearful. Right? Now, now in saying that, I would have to say, I mean, this is, this is fact, okay? I would have to add that you can be a spiritual Christian and be what we would think of as under attack and you sense these things. But that's not you being this. It is you being attacked. Now, the difference is if you're being it, this is how you live on a regular basis. But whenever you're being attacked, matter of fact, it is so unique for you that you recognize this ain't normal, yeah. right? And when you recognize that, that shows that you're spiritual minded, at least in that area. And it shows that you recognize, okay, something has to be done. I need to fight this. I need to go at something what it is, but you go according to the word of God. And many times it's just a matter of going, okay, first off, my mind is on God, so he keeps me in perfect peace. So that nervousness has to go. Now, if, that, if there's still a fear there, now you deal with the fear, right? So <clears throat> on the next page, this is a, what we would call a contemplation topic, something for you to think about, uh, overnight especially. <clears throat> according to the following scripture, is it possible for a spiritually minded person, a Christian, to die of sickness or disease? Now think about that, all right? Here's the scripture. For they, Romans chapter 8, verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity, hostile, at war with God, against God, it says here. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now you hear that. Now get this. The carnal mind cannot be subject to the law of God. But now we know that the, that, or, what did I say? Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, now watch. Because I want to emphasize two things. Number one, the carnal mind is enmity, hostile toward God. Okay, it's against God in that sense. <clears throat> For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now what that means, what he's saying here, and we have to realize the law of God is not just talking about the law of Moses. That's right. If it was the law of Moses, it'd say the law of Moses. Right? It's talking about the law of God. Now we have to realize that the law of Moses was not bad. It, it, the law of... Okay. If you perfectly fulfill the law of Moses, <clears throat> that is how God wants you to live. All right? If you but the problem is, nobody perfectly fulfills it. So we needed help. We need to be born again because we were carnally minded, but now we're supposed to be spiritual minded. But now you realize that as a carnally minded person, even as a carnally minded Christian, it says here, you are still at enmity against God. That mind, your mind is enmity, it wars against God, argues against God, and it says it's not subject to the law of God, which tells us we are supposed to be subject to the law of God. Ooh, it got quiet. Yeah. Right? And, but it says it cannot be, it will not be subject to the law of God, it can't be subject to the law of God. Why? Because it's carnal, which means that the law of God is spiritual. Yeah. You get that? Now, the, the, see, the problem with the law of God is not the law of God. The problem with the law of God is you couldn't live up to it. That's the problem, right? And then Jesus came and gave us life. And now, the, every time we walk in, because what is the fulfillment of the law? Love. 
If you walk in love perfectly, you will fulfill all the law of God. It's that simple. And if you do that, the law of God is fulfilled in us who believe, the Bible says. Isn't that right? So now realize, how are we able to do that? Because the love of Christ is shed abroad in our hearts. So we have the love of God through Christ living in us. And if we have that love living in us, then we are to live that love life all the time. And if we lived love all the time, we would never disobey the, disobey the law. And that's, isn't that simple? But now you have people talking about the law as if it's some horrible, terrible thing. And if that's true, then God is the source of that horrible, terrible thing. Why? Because it says because of man's transgression. Why? To show him his transgression and to show him his need for Christ. So the law was given to us to show us our need not, and to show us, you're not living up to my standard. The law of God is the standard of God. Guess what? The law of God is still a standard of God. Amen. But now he gives you his spirit so you can live up to it. Yeah. Amen? But we don't go by it in the sense of going and going and going and make the checklist and go down the list. That's not the point. Right? The point is now, I don't need a checklist because I have the Spirit of God in me and I'm going to obey the law even if I don't know there's a law there. Why? Because His nature in me has me walk the way He wants me to walk. Is that not the simplest thing in the world? Yes. Right? If you want to take that and use that as a, a discourse on grace, there you go. Because that's essentially what, what I was just talking about. Right? Now, look at this. <clears throat> How is our life changed? Romans 12, 1 and 2, we know. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We've already discussed this, so I'm not going to go into detail. Verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we know that's how our life is changed, by the renewing of the mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, it says that you put off. Who's going to put it off? You are, right? Okay. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, <clears throat> and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Right? Now notice, being renewed in the spirit of your mind <clears throat> also is part of putting off that old man. Right? You're not going to put off the old man until the mind is renewed. And you have to be renewed not just in the mind, but in the spirit of the mind. So you have to go beyond, because there are a lot of people that can quote scripture, but their attitude, the spirit of their mind, is rotten, right? And that's usually the people that you see that people talk about being judgmental religious Christians because of their attitude. When you have churches that their whole goal is to stand in front of uh, you know, funerals and tell people they're going to hell, Okay, that is not, no, God has never called any person to that kind of ministry. We have been called the ministry of reconciliation, not the ministry of judgment and condemnation. That's old covenant, and we're new covenant. Amen? That doesn't say that everything's right, okay? I'm just saying that, that you, if you're called a ministry, you're called to draw people to God, and that is not drawing anybody to God. The goodness of God draws men to repentance. Amen? Amen? All right, so now we are to be, we should be known for our love for God and man, right? God first, man second, okay? If you, if you love man first and God second, then you'll do whatever man wants to do and go along with it. But if you love God first and man second, then you will do what God wants done and it'll bless man, okay? So you have to keep that in order. He says here in verse 24, and that you put on the new man. Now we'll look at this new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, this is, uh, the King James is not the easiest way to read this verse because it puts things around. We would, would say uh, that you put on the new man, which is created in righteousness and true holiness after God. That's the way we would say it today because of our, our language. And we would be saying that, in, in, that we are recreated, our new, our new man, is recreated in righteousness and true holiness in the likeness and image of God, that we're recreated in that likeness. And, but now notice, this new man is in the likeness and image of God, which is what God started with in Genesis chapter 1. Isn't that right? So that's the purpose. Now God is trying to get us back there. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. 
be ye angry. There's a command right there, one everybody can fulfill. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, <laughs> I'm looking for a command to fulfill. There's my <laughs> command for today. Right? I'm going to be angry. Well, there's another part. And sin not. All right? And there's a thin line there. And let not the sun go down upon your wrath. All right? Neither give place to the devil. Which shows us that that going through anger and to the point that you sin is giving place to the devil. And that word place is a Greek word topos, which means ground, right? It means land, technically, giving, giving place, giving territory, giving land to the enemy. But now, notice, and it's funny because everybody uses that in the area of sickness, and it doesn't say sickness here, even though prolonged anger can, actually sets up stress in the body that'll cause the body to start shaking apart, right? Now that's not a technical term, but that's what it actually does is it actually causes things to start falling apart if you stay in a level of anger, which is a heightened sense of stress for an extended period of time, right? Now, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, mortify therefore, your, that means to kill, your members, which are, and if you're a pastor, we have to differentiate what members means here, okay? <laughs> we we want to be specific about what members you're to mortify, or that you're to kill, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> which are upon the earth. Well, there we go. We just, any, any members on the earth? <laughs> no, he gives us the line right here. And he says, kill this, okay? Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness is idolatry. And the thing is, for covetousness, the, the full definition of covetousness includes envy. Okay? Envy is a part of covetousness. So, and that is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Now, this was written by the Apostle Paul, written to the church at Colossae, which means that it is after the, the resurrection, which means it is for now. Right? And he tells now, he didn't say, don't worry about what you do, it's all under grace. He didn't say that. He says, put this away, don't do this. And then he says, because if you do these things, it is for this reason that they're doing these things that the wrath of God is coming upon the children of disobedience. Now notice, it does not say because they have not accepted Jesus, which is what you hear. Oh, nobody goes to hell because of sin now. It's, if it is, it's the sin of rejecting Jesus. It's just they don't know Jesus, they don't accept Jesus, and therefore that's the only thing, reason you're going to hell for. No, it says right here. The wrath of God comes on these people, on the children of disobedience, because they're doing these things. Your actions still have consequences. And you say, well, it doesn't, that's not applying to me. I'm not a child of disobedience. I'm a Christian. If you're doing these things, you're a child of disobedience because you're disobeying. So I don't care what you call yourself, what you claim yourself. You have to realize that your confession has to match your lifestyle. Amen. All right? Devils don't care what you say you are. Yeah. What they look for is how do you act? What do you do? How are you living your life? And that's how they zero in and find your weaknesses and they try to exploit those weaknesses. Not because of what you... If, if devils listen to the fact that you said you're a Christian, they'd leave every, all Christians alone. Because they go, oh, he says he's a Christian, so I'm not going to mess with him. No, they say, well, he says this, but here's how he lives. And so we can get in through this door. Right? Now, in, in the witch, and I notice he's talking about these things. When it says in the witch, it's talking about the things in verse 5. These actions... Uh, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness. Now, in the which you also walked some time when you lived in them. But now notice he's talking about past times, and he said that's not what you do now, right? He says, but now you also put off all these. In other words, you already put these other things aside, and now you put these things aside too, right? So you don't, he's saying you've already put aside the other stuff. Which means if you're a Christian, you've put aside that stuff. Now, I know I'm repeating myself, but you've got to get that. If you're a Christian, you've put aside that stuff, right? And then he says, and matter of fact, now put aside these two. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. You get that? You might want to underline that one. Filthy communication. Now, here's what we have to remember. What, it's, it doesn't matter what we call filthy communication. What counts is what he calls filthy communication. Right? And filthy communication is anything that does not line up with his word, anything that is not words of life and words of spirit. Right? And it can include even things that are generally seen in culture 
as not a big deal, right? You know, I've never been a cusser, okay? Even when I was growing up, I, I, you know, uh, for me to cuss, especially before I gave my life to Christ, I mean, you really had to push me. It had to be, I had to get to a breaking point. I just didn't, to me, uh, because of stuff I'd read and things, my understanding was if you had to cuss to get your point across, it's because you had a very limited vocabulary, That's right. right? I would much rather use the words I knew, have you walk off and have to go look them up to realize that I had cut you to pieces. Right? So uh, that's what I used dictionaries for, was to find those words that people didn't understand. And, and then I would just cut them apart, and then they'd go look them up. Well, I don't, I don't even know, I don't understand what you said. Well, go look it up. Then they get mad, but they're not near me. Right? So, you know, so, so, now, but whenever, uh, but as I'm saying, I would rather, and I, and I don't like being around cussing. I, I don't like it, 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 especially in mixed company. You see, and nowadays, it's, it doesn't matter, it's coming out of everybody's mouth. You know, you get in public, I, I'm amazed at how people talk. Even books, you go to the bookstore and the titles of books are the vilest words. And I'm, I'm shocked. And they're bestsellers, you know, because it's like they're, you know, showing, oh, I'm cool. I'm, I'm breaking these norms. It's, it's not cool. It's a limited vocabulary and you're speaking filth. And so whenever, so if I get around that, say, I don't like really being around it anyway, but I would rather hear somebody cuss rather than say, that makes me sick or I'm dying to go. Right. Why? Because that is worse yeah. than just cussing, right? Unless, of course, you're, you know, damning somebody. And because that's, if you're damning somebody, that's about as worse as it can get, right? Obviously, you talk about taking God's name in vain, things like that. But... The reason it's in vain is because he's not the dammer. That's right. Right? So you need to realize that what we're talking about here is that when people use those words, filthy communication, evil communication, all these things are the same level that they go against the word of God. And honestly, these are the, some of the high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. And these are things that we have to pull down and things that we have to bring into captivity. Right? So, now, it says... Yeah, uh, and have put on the new man, which is, now watch this. Now I guess I gotta go back. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, seeing that you've done that. So he's saying, we have to say, assuming you've done that now, since you say you're Christian, you've put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now that verse is so, you could meditate on that a long time, and it would be so powerful. Because it says here, and have put on the new man. So now you've put on this new man, which is renewed in knowledge. The new man in you is renewed in knowledge. This new man has the knowledge of God. And this, it's renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, which is God. Right? So the knowledge you have, what he's saying is, listen, you're a new creation. You're a new person. And it, this, this, the information that is in this new you is the knowledge of God. So now we are to have this knowledge of God come out of us, to be transformed. What's in us needs to come out. That means we have to walk in, know, and speak the knowledge of God. Amen? As we said before, the church is to make the manifold wisdom of God present and visible to principalities and powers, and they are to learn the wisdom of God from us, the church. But it won't be that way if we talk like the world. And if we keep denying what God has said. Now, there's a whole lot when it says, you know, if you deny me, I'll deny you before my father. You ought to study that out sometime. Because when you start talking about denying Christ, there's a lot of levels of that, right? There is obviously the, I don't believe in him and going to hell thing. There's, that's obvious. But there is also the aspect of denying what he said, because he is the word made flesh. Yeah. The words he spoke was part of him. So if you deny what he said, you are denying him. And so you need to learn what he said, learn what the book says, say what it said, not deny it, but agree with it. Amen. Amen? Now, one aspect of you denying him and him denying you, right? Don't, well, I'm not going to tell you not to get scared over that but I'm, because you need to be aware of it. But you need to realize if you deny him by denying his words, his denying you doesn't mean he's going to say, all right, Father, I don't know him. Send him to hell. That's not, if you deny his word concerning healing, 
then what you're saying here will be upheld there. Maybe, uh, well, I don't guess I, well, maybe I told you about it. Did, did I mention Numbers 13 yesterday? I did, didn't I? Yeah. Numbers 13? Because I know I talked about it in Wisconsin. But it, it, whenever God will treat you according to what you speak about him. So if you deny the words of Jesus and say, oh, he doesn't heal anymore, then Jesus says, okay, Father, he doesn't believe you heal anymore. So you don't have to worry about healing him because that's, that's, he doesn't believe in that. You, you understand what I'm saying? So if you deny him in his words, he will deny you. That's what he said. Right? I didn't say that. I didn't write that. He said, you deny me, I will deny you. And there are levels or the spectrum of, of denying him. Right? So, all right, let's keep moving. Look at the next page. The real and the counterfeit. As with anything, there are counterfeits to the real. We must be wise with the wisdom of God and not fall prey to the counterfeits. In the realm of spiritual manifestations, there are and have been many counterfeits that were intended to take our eyes off Jesus and on to something else. Watchman Nee wrote a book specifically about spiritual counterfeits called The Latent Power of the Soul, or of the Human Soul also. In the area of the soul and the mind, we must be even more discerning. Galatians, the book of Galatians, warns us of the works of the flesh, specifically naming witchcraft, as a work of the flesh and therefore a work of the soul. Okay? Witchcraft is not spiritual. It is soulish. It comes out of the soul because it comes out of the flesh. Now, Galatians 5.19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. In other words, this isn't a whole list. It's this and anything like this. Now, the Bible also says that if you, uh, not, that not only the people that do certain things will go to hell. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but not, not too much. But it says not only the ones that do them, but those that take part in, the, those that enjoy what they do. In other words, it, okay. People, uh, Jim Caviezel, Y'all know Jim Caviezel? Yeah. And, uh, played Christ in the Passion? Okay, whenever he played Christ, he actually, in Hollywood, there are parts that he's not considered for because he said, I will never do a nude scene. I will not do that. He's, he's married, and he said, you can't act like you're committing adultery on TV and not be committing adultery. He said, just because you're acting doesn't mean you're not doing it. You're actually doing this thing. And he said, so I won't do that. All right? Now, there, but if you watch a scene where somebody's doing that, and you take pleasure in that scene. It is just as if you did that sin. Amen. Do you get that? Yeah. And so you are guilty of that sin by taking pleasure in watching that situation. Right. Do you get that? Yeah. Right? And that's what the Bible says, that if you take pleasure in it, you are just as guilty as the people doing it. And the Bible says that if you do those things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. It is that simple. Now, Listen, God has told me to begin telling people that my, that, that my heart toward people and the reason I say the things that I do is for this, and I'm supposed to start saying it and saying it regularly. I hadn't even said it here this week, but I, I'm to say it regularly, and it's this. I love you enough to tell you the truth. Whether you like it or not, whether you want it or not, whether you listen or not, I'm still going to tell you the truth. Why? Because I love you, and I want to see you make it. Amen? Amen. And I'm not going to back off, even if I end up preaching just my family, even you know, if that's the only ones I can demand that they be here. Uh, you know, <laughs> you want to eat? Sit on the front row. That's where you're going to be, right? No, <laughs> no. But uh, you know, if that if that's my lot to where the, the you know the crowds dwindled to where I'm preaching to a handful, so be it. I will preach truth no matter what it costs, right? I, I was I was working a job when I found this job, amen. And if I need to go get a job, I can go get a job other than this job. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not dependent on this job, right, uh, to live. We, God will take care of me no matter what I'm doing, and it doesn't matter how many people are in front of me. Amen? Amen. So, I love you enough to tell you the truth. You. So, it's that simple. So, now, it goes on. It says, uh, envying. Yeah, envying. Well, we went on. Of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now, I don't know if you know it or not, but there are nine fruit of the Spirit. There are nine gifts of the Spirit. And there are nine beatitudes. 
denying the attitude to tell you what attitude you are to be, right? And so that's how you're to live. Whenever you live the nine Beatitudes, you will have the manifestation of the nine gifts of the Spirit because the nine fruit of the Spirit will also be manifested in your life. Those three work together. Amen? All right, just that was by the way. Many, <clears throat> yeah, well, let me read the rest of it. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. You can do that as much as you want. Any of those things, there's no limit, right? Many of the present manifestations that are touted as proof of the elevated spirituality of various ministers are simply works of the flesh, namely witchcraft, right? And we'll talk about that probably tomorrow a little bit. Um, matter of fact, I've got to stop now. So we're going to stop right there, and we will draw a line right there, and we will pick this up first thing in the morning. Amen? Come on up, ma'am. Right, I'm sorry, one more session. we got one more session. I don't know what I'm thinking. I'm sorry. If you are considering partnering with us and would like to support our mission, please visit jglm.org forward slash partners. Proceeds will go toward the cost of the television broadcast and our mission work around the world.